The Story of Civilization, Volume 2, The Life of Greece, Part 1, by Will Durant, Continued, Cassette 9, Side 1. Meanwhile, the money changer at his table, Trapeza, begins in the 5th century to receive money on deposit and to lend it to merchants at interest rates that vary from 12 to 30 percent according to the risk. In this way he becomes a banker, though to the end of ancient Greece he keeps his early name of Trapezate, the man at the table. He takes his methods from the Near East, improves them, and passes them on to Rome, which hands them down to modern Europe. Soon after the Persian War, Themistocles deposits 70 talents, or $420,000, with the Corinthian banker Philostephanus, very much as political adventurers feather foreign nests for themselves today. This is the earliest known allusion to secular, non-temple banking. Towards the end of the century, Antisthenes and Archistratus establish what will become, under Pation, the most famous of all private Greek banks. Through such trapezatai, money circulates more freely and rapidly, and so does more work than before. And the facilities that they offer stimulate creatively the expansion of Athenian trade. Trade, not industry or finance, is the soul of Athenian economy. Though many producers still sell directly to the consumer, a growing number of them require the intermediary of the market, whose function it is to buy and store goods until the consumer is ready to purchase them. In this way, a class of retailers arises who peddle their wares through the streets or in the wake of armies or at festivals or fairs or offer them for sale in shops or stalls in the agora or elsewhere in the town. To the shops come freemen or metics or slaves to haggle with tradesmen and buy for the home. One of the severest disabilities suffered by the free women of Athens is that custom does not allow them to shop. Foreign commerce advances even faster than domestic trade, for the Greek states have learned the advantages of an international division of labor, and each specializes in some product. The shield-maker, for example, no longer goes from city to city at the call of those who need him, but makes his shields in his shop and sends them out to the markets of the classic world. In one century, Athens moves from household economy, wherein each household makes nearly all that it needs, to urban economy, wherein each town makes nearly all that it needs, to international economy, where each state is dependent upon imports and must make exports to pay for them. The Athenian fleet for two generations keeps the Aegean clear of pirates, and from 480 to 430 commerce thrives as it never will again until Pompey suppresses piracy in 67 B.C. The docks, warehouses, markets, and banks of the Piraeus offer every facility for trade. Soon the busy port becomes the chief center of distribution and reshipment for the commerce between the east and the west. The articles which it is difficult to get, one here, one there, from the rest of the world, says Isocrates, all these it is easy to buy in Athens. The magnitude of our city, says Thucydides, draws the produce of the world into our harbor, so that to the Athenian the fruits of other countries are as familiar a luxury as those of his own. From the Piraeus merchants carry the wine, oil, wool, minerals, marble, pottery, arms, luxuries, books, and works of art produced by the fields and shops of Attica. To the Piraeus they bring grain from the Byzantium, Syria, Egypt, Italy, and Sicily, fruit and cheese from Sicily and Phoenicia, meat from Phoenicia and Italy, fish from the Black Sea, nuts from Paphlagonia, copper from Cyprus, tin from England, iron from the Pontic coast, gold from Thasos and Thrace, timber from Thrace and Cyprus, embroideries from the Near East, wools, flax, and dyes from Phoenicia, spices from Cyrene, swords from Chalcis, glass from Egypt, tiles from Corinth, beds from Chios and Miletus, boots and bronzes from Etruria, ivory from Ethiopia, perfumes and ointments from Arabia, slaves from Lydia, Syria, and Scythia. The colonies serve not only as markets but as shipping agents to send Athenian goods into the interior, and though the cities of Ionia decay in the 5th century because the trade that once passed there is diverted to the Propontis and Caria during and after the Persian War, Italy and Sicily replace them as outlets for the surplus products and population of mainland Greece. We may estimate the amount of Aegean commerce from the return of 1,200 talents from a 5% tax laid in 413 upon the imports and exports of the cities in the Athenian Empire, indicating a trade of $144 million a year. The danger lurking in this prosperity is the growing dependence of Athens upon imported grain, 
Hence her insistence upon controlling the Hellespont and the Black Sea, her persistent colonizing of the coasts and isles on the way to the Straits, and her disastrous expeditions to Egypt in 459 and to Sicily in 415. It is this dependence that persuades Athens to transform the confederacy of Delos into an empire. And when in 405 the Spartans destroy the Athenian fleet in the Hellespont, the starvation and surrender of Athens are inevitable results. Nevertheless, it is this trade that makes Athens rich and provides with the imperial tribute the sinews of her cultural development. The merchants who accompany their goods to all quarters of the Mediterranean come back with changed perspective and alert and open minds. They bring new ideas and ways, break down ancient taboos and sloth, and replace the familial conservatism of a rural aristocracy with the individualistic and progressive spirit of a mercantile civilization. Here in Athens, east and west meet and jar each other from their ruts. Old myths lose their grasp on the souls of men. Leisure rises, inquiry is supported, science and philosophy grow. Athens becomes the most intensely alive city of her time. 4. Freemen and Slaves Why does all this work? In the countryside it is done by citizens, their families, and free hired men. In Athens, it is done partly by citizens, partly by freedmen, more by medics, mostly by slaves. The shopkeepers, artisans, merchants, and bankers come almost entirely from the voteless classes. The burgher looks down upon manual labor and does as little of it as he may. To work for a livelihood is considered ignoble. Even the professional practice or teaching of music, sculpture, or painting is accounted by many Greeks a mean occupation. To hear blunt Xenophon, who speaks, however, as a proud member of the knightly class, the base mechanic arts, so-called, are held in ill repute by civilized communities, and not unreasonably. Seeing they are the ruin of the bodies of all concerned in them, workers and overseers alike, who are forced to remain in sitting postures or to hug the gloom, or else to crouch whole days confronting a furnace. Hand in hand with physical enervation follows a pace and enfeebling of soul, while the demand which these base mechanic arts make on time of those employed in them leaves them no leisure to devote to the claims of friendship and the state. Trade is similarly scorned. To the aristocratic or philosophical Greek it is merely money-making at the expense of others. It aims not to create goods but to buy them cheap and sell them dear. No respectable citizen will engage in it, though he may quietly invest in it and profit from it so long as he lets others do the work. A freeman says the Greek must be free from economic tasks. He must get slaves or others to attend to his material concerns, even, if he can, to take care of his property and his fortune. Only by such liberation can he find time for government, war, literature, and philosophy. Without a leisure class there can be, in the Greek view, no standards of taste, no encouragement of the arts, no civilization. No man who is in a hurry is quite civilized. Most of the functions associated in history with the middle class are in Athens performed by metics, freemen of foreign birth who, though ineligible to citizenship, have fixed their domicile in Athens. For the most part they are professional men, merchants, contractors, manufacturers, managers, tradesmen, craftsmen, artists, who in the course of their wandering have found in Athens the economic liberty, opportunity, and stimulus, which to them is far more vital than the vote. The most important industrial undertakings outside of mining are owned by metics. The ceramic industry is theirs completely, and wherever middlemen can squeeze themselves in between producer and consumer they are to be found. The law harasses them and protects them. It taxes them like citizens, lays liturgies upon them, exacts military service from them, and adds a poll tax for good measure. It forbids them to own land or to marry into the family of a citizen. It excludes them from its religious organization and from direct appeal to its courts. But it welcomes them into its economic life, appreciates their industry and skill, enforces their contracts, gives them religious freedom, and guards their wealth against violent revolution. Some of them flaunt their riches vulgarly, but some of them too work quietly in science, literature, and the arts, practice law or medicine, and create schools of rhetoric and philosophy. In the fourth century they will provide the authors and subject of the comic drama, and in the third, they will set the cosmopolitan tone of Hellenistic society. They itch for citizenship, but they love Athens proudly and contribute painfully to finance her defense against her enemies. Through them, chiefly, the fleet is maintained, the empire is supported, and the commercial supremacy of Athens is preserved.
Mingled with the metics in political disabilities and economic opportunities are the freedmen, those who once were slaves. For though it is inconvenient to liberate a slave, since usually he must be replaced by another, yet the promise of freedom is an economical stimulus to a young slave, and many Greeks, as death approaches, reward their most loyal slaves with manumission. The slave may be freed through ransoming by relatives or friends, as in the case of Plato, or the state, indemnifying his owner, may free him for service in war, or he himself may save his obols until he can buy his liberty. Like the metic, the freedman engages in industry, trade, or finance. At the lowest, he may do for pay the work of a slave. At the top, he may become a magnate of industry. Milius manages Demosthenes' armor factory. Pation and Formio become the richest bankers in Athens. The freedman is especially valued as an executive, for no one is more severe with slaves than the man who has come up from slavery and has known only oppression all the days of his life. Beneath these three classes, citizens, medics, and freedmen, are the 115,000 slaves of Attica. They are recruited from unransomed prisoners of war, victims of slave raids, infants rescued from exposure, wastrels, and criminals. Few of them in Greece are Greeks. The Hellene looks upon foreigners as natural slaves, since they so readily give absolute obedience to a king, and he does not account the servitude of such men to Greeks as unreasonable. But he balks at the enslavement of a Greek and seldom stoops to it. Greek traders buy slaves as they would merchandise and offer them for sale at Chios, Delos, Corinth, Aegina, Athens, and wherever else they can find purchasers. The slave dealers at Athens are among the richest of the metics. In Delos it is not unusual for a thousand slaves to be sold in a day. Simon, after the battle of the Eurymedon, puts twenty thousand prisoners on the slave market. At Athens there is a mart where slaves stand ready for naked inspection and bargaining purchase at any time. They cost from half a mina to ten minas, fifty to a thousand dollars. They may be bought for direct use or for investment. Men and women in Athens find it profitable to buy slaves and rent them to homes, factories, or mines. The return is as high as thirty-three percent. Even the poorest citizen has a slave or two. Eschines, to prove his poverty, complains that his family has only seven. Rich homes may have fifty. The Athenian government employs a number of slaves as clerks, attendants, minor officials, or policemen. Many of these receive their clothing and a daily allowance of half a drachma, and are permitted to live where they please. In the countryside the slaves are few, and are chiefly women servants in the home. In northern Greece and most of the Peloponnesus, serfdom makes slavery superfluous. In Corinth, Megara, and Athens, slaves do most of the manual labor, and women slaves most of the domestic toil. But slaves do also a great part of the clerical and some of the executive work in industry, commerce, and finance. Most skilled labor is performed by freemen, freedmen, or metics, and there are no learned slaves as there will be in the Hellenistic period and in Rome. The slave is seldom allowed to bring up children of his own, for it is cheaper to buy a slave than to rear one. If the slave misbehaves, he is whipped. If he testifies, he is tortured. When he is struck by a freeman, he must not defend himself. But if he is subject to great cruelty, he may flee to a temple, and then his master must sell him. In no case may his master kill him. So long as he labors, he has more security than many who in other civilizations are not called slaves. When he is ill or old or there is no work for him to do, his master does not throw him upon public relief, but continues to take care of him. If he is loyal, he is treated like a faithful servant, almost like a member of the family. He is often allowed to go into business, provided he will pay his owner a part of his earnings. He is free from taxation and from military service. Nothing in his costume distinguishes him in 5th century Athens from the freeman. Indeed, the old oligarch, who about 425 writes a pamphlet on the polity of the Athenians, complains that the slave does not make way for citizens on the street, that he talks freely and acts in every detail as if he were the equal of the citizen. Athens is known for mildness to her slaves. It is a common judgment that slaves are better off in democratic Athens than poor freemen in oligarchic states. Slave revolts, though feared, are rare in Attica. Nevertheless, the Athenian conscience is disturbed by the existence of slavery, and the philosophers who defend it reveal almost as clearly as those who denounce it that the moral development of the nation has outrun its institutions. Plato condemns the enslavement of Greeks by Greeks, 
but for the rest accepts slavery on the ground that some people have underprivileged minds. Aristotle looks upon the slave as an animate tool and thinks that slavery will continue in some form until all menial work can be done by self-operating machines. The average Greek, though kind to his slaves, has no notion of how a cultured society can get along without slavery. To abolish slavery, he feels it would be necessary to abolish Athens. Others are more radical. The Cynic philosophers condemn slavery outright. Their successors, the Stoics, will condemn it more politely. Euripides again and again stirs his audiences by sympathetic pictures of war-captured slaves, and the sophist Alcidamus goes about Greece preaching unmolested the doctrine of Rousseau, almost in the words of Rousseau. God has sent all men into the world free, and nature has made no man a slave. But slavery goes on. 5. The War of the Classes The exploitation of man by man is less severe in Athens and Thebes than in Sparta or Rome, but it is adequate to the purpose. There are no castes among the freemen in Athens, and a man may by resolute ability rise to anything but citizenship. Hence, in part, the fever and turbulence of Athenian life. There is no tense class distinction between employer and employee except in the mines. Usually the master works beside his men, and personal acquaintance dulls the edge of exploitation. The wage of nearly all artisans of whatever class is a drachma for each actual day of work, but unskilled workers may get as low as three obols, or fifty cents a day. Piecework tends to replace time work as the factory system develops, and wages begin to vary more widely. A contractor may hire slaves from their owner for a rental of one to four obols a day, we may estimate the buying power of these wages by comparing Greek prices with our own. In 414, a house and estate in Attica cost 1,200 drachmas. A medimnus, or one and a half bushels of barley, costs a drachma in the 6th century, two at the close of the 5th, three in the 4th, five in the time of Alexander. A sheep costs a drachma in Solon's day, 10 to 20 at the end of the 5th century. In Athens, as elsewhere, currency tends to increase faster than goods, and prices rise. At the close of the 4th century, prices are five times as high as at the opening of the 6th. They double from 480 to 404, and again from 404 to 330. A single man lives comfortably on 120 drachmas, or $120 a month. We may judge from this the condition of the worker who earns 30 drachmas per month, and has a family. It is true that the state comes to his relief in times of great stress, and then distributes corn at a nominal price. But he observes that the goddess of liberty is no friend to the goddess of equality, and that under the free laws of Athens the strong grow stronger, the rich richer, while the poor remain poor. Individualism stimulates the able and degrades the simple. It creates wealth magnificently and concentrates it dangerously. In Athens, as in other states, cleverness gets all that it can, and mediocrity gets the rest. The landowner profits from the rising value of his land. The merchant does his best, despite a hundred laws, to secure corners and monopolies. The speculator reaps, through the high rate of interest on loans, the lion's share of the proceeds of industry and trade. Demagogues arise who point out to the poor the inequality of human possessions, and conceal from them the inequality of human economic ability. The poor man, face to face with wealth, becomes conscious of his poverty, broods over his unrewarded merits, and dreams of perfect states. Bitterer than the war of Greece with Persia, or of Athens with Sparta, is, in all the Greek states, the war of class with class. In Attica it begins with the conflict between the new rich and the landed aristocracy. The ancient families still love the soil, and live for the greater part on their estates. Division of the patrimony through many generations has made the average holding small. The rich Alcibiades has only seventy acres, and the squire in most cases labors personally on the soil or in the management of his property. But though the aristocrat is not rich, he is proud. He adds his father's name to his own as a title of nobility, and he remains aloof as long as he can from the mercantile bourgeoisie which is capturing the wealth of Athens's growing trade. His wife, however, cries for a city home and the varied life and opportunities of the metropolis. His daughters wish to live in Athens and snare rich husbands. His sons hope to find Hetairai there and to give gay parties in the style of the nouveau riche. As the aristocrat cannot compete in luxury with the merchants and manufacturers, he accepts them, or their children, as sons-in-law or daughters-in-law. They are anxious to climb and willing to pay. 
The upshot is a union of the rich in land with the rich in money, and the formation of an upper class of oligarchs, envied and hated by the poor, angry at the excesses and extravagance of democracy, and fearful of revolution. It is the insolence of the new wealth that brings on the second phase of the class war, the struggle of the poorer citizens against the rich. Many of the bourgeoisie flaunt their wealth like Alcibiades, but few others can so charm the mechanic multitude by dramatic audacity and elegance of person or speech. Young men, conscious of ability and frustrated with poverty, translate their personal need for opportunity and place into a general gospel of revolt, and intellectuals eager for new ideas and the applause of the oppressed formulate for them the aims of their rebellion. They call not for the socialization of industry and trade, but for the abolition of debts and the redistribution of the land among the citizens. For the radical movement in 5th century Athens is confined to the poorer voters and never dreams at this stage of liberating the slaves or letting the medics in on the reallotment of the soil. The leaders talk of a golden past in which all men were equal in possessions, but they do not wish to be taken too literally when they speak of restoring that paradise. It is an aristocratic communism that they have in mind, not a nationalization of the land by the state, but an equal sharing of it by the citizens. They point out how unreal is the equality of the franchise in the face of mounting economic inequality, but they are resolved to use the political power of the poorer citizenry to persuade the assembly to sluice into the pockets of the needy by fines, liturgies, confiscations, and public works, some of the concentrated wealth of the rich, and to give a lead to future rebels they adopt red as the symbolic color of their revolt. In the face of this threat, the rich band themselves in secret organizations, pledged to take common action against what Plato, despite his communism, will call the monstrous beast of the aroused and hungry mob. The free workers also organize, have at least since Solon organized, themselves into clubs, Aranoi, Theosoi, of stonemasons, marble cutters, woodworkers, ivory workers, potters, fishermen, actors, etc. Socrates is a member of a sculptor's Theosos. But these groups are not so much trade unions as mutual benefit societies. They come together in meeting places called synods or synagogues, have banquets and games, and worship a patron deity. They make payments to sick members and contract collectively for specific enterprises. But they do not enter visibly into the Athenian class war. The battle is fought on the fields of literature and politics. Pamphleteers like the old oligarch issue denunciations or defenses of democracy. The comic poets since their plays require rich men to finance their production, are on the side of the drachmas, and pour ridicule upon the radical leaders and their utopias. In the Ecclesiastes, 392, Aristophanes introduces us to the lady communist Praxagora, who makes an oration as follows. I want all to have a share of everything, and all property to be in common. There will no longer be either rich or poor. No longer shall we see one man harvesting vast tracts of land, while another has not ground enough to be buried in. I intend that there shall be only one and the same condition of life for all. I shall begin by making land, money, everything that is private property common to all. Women shall belong to all men in common. But who, asks Bleparus, will do the work? The slaves, is her reply. In another comedy, the Plutus, 408, Aristophanes allows poverty, who is threatened with extinction, to defend herself as the necessary goad to human toil and enterprise. I am the sole cause of all your blessings, and your safety depends upon me alone. Who would wish to hammer iron, build ships, sew, turn, cut up leather, bake bricks, bleach linen, tan hides, or break up the soil with the plow and garner the gifts of Demeter, if he could live in idleness and free from all this work? If your system, communism, is applied, you will not be able to sleep in a bed, for no more will ever be manufactured, nor on carpets, for who would weave them if he had gold? The reforms of Ephialtes and Pericles are the first achievement of the democratic revolt. Pericles is a man of judgment and moderation. He does not wish to destroy the rich, but to preserve them and their enterprise by easing the condition of the poor. But after his death in 429, the democracy becomes so radical that the oligarchic party conspires again with Sparta and makes in 411 and once more in 404 a rich man's revolution. Nevertheless, because wealth is great in Athens and trickles down to many, and because fear of a slave uprising gives the citizenry pause, the class war in Athens is milder and sooner reaches a working compromise than in Greek states where the middle class 
is not strong enough to mediate between rich and poor. At Samos, in 412, the radicals seize the government, execute 200 aristocrats, banish 400 more, divide up the lands and houses among themselves, and develop another society like that which they have overthrown. At Leontini, in 422, the commoners expel the oligarchs, but soon afterward take to flight. At Corsaira, in 427, the oligarchs assassinate 60 leaders of the popular party. The Democrats seize the government, imprison 400 aristocrats, try 50 of them before a kind of committee of public safety, and execute all 50 at once, seeing which a considerable number of the surviving prisoners slay one another, others kill themselves, and the rest are walled up in the temple in which they have sought sanctuary and are starved to death. Thucydides describes the class war in Greece in a timeless passage. During seven days the Corsairians were engaged in butchering those of their fellow citizens whom they regarded as their enemies, and although the crime imputed was that of attempting to put down the democracy, some were slain also for private hatred, others by their debtors because of the monies owed to them. Death thus raged in every shape, and as usually happens at such times, there was no length to which violence did not go. Sons were killed by their fathers, and suppliants were dragged from the altar or slain upon it. Revolution thus ran its course from city to city, and the places where it arrived last, from having heard what had been done before, carried to still greater excess the refinement of their inventions and the atrocity of their reprisals. Corsaira gave the first example of these crimes, of the revenge exacted by the governed, who had never experienced equitable treatment or indeed aught but violence from their rulers, when their hour came, of the iniquitous resolves of those who desired to get rid of their accustomed poverty and ardently coveted their neighbor's goods, and the savage and pitiless excesses into which men who had begun the struggle not in a class but in a party spirit were hurried by their passions. In the confusion into which life was now thrown in the cities, human nature, always rebelling against the law and now its master, gladly showed itself ungoverned in passion, above respect for justice and the enemy of all superiority. Reckless audacity came now to be considered the courage of a loyal ally. Prudent hesitation, specious cowardice, moderation was held to be a cloak for unmanliness. Ability to see all sides of a question was accounted inability to act on any. The cause of all these evils was the lust for power arising from greed and ambition. The leaders in the cities, each provided with the fairest professions, on the one side with the cry of the political equality of the people, on the other of a moderate aristocracy, sought prizes for themselves in those public interests which they pretended to cherish, and, recoiling from no means in their struggle for ascendancy, engaged in the direst excesses. Religion was in honor with neither party, but the use of fair phrases to arrive at guilty ends was in high reputation. The ancient simplicity into which honor so largely entered was laughed down and disappeared, and society became divided into camps in which no man trusted his fellow. Meanwhile, the moderate part of the citizens perished between the two, either for not joining in the quarrel, or because envy would not suffer them to escape. The whole Hellenic world was convulsed. Athens survives this turbulence because every Athenian is at heart an individualist and loves private property, and because the Athenian government finds a practicable medium between socialism and individualism in a moderate regulation of business and wealth. The state is not afraid to regulate. It sets a limit upon the size of dowries, the cost of funerals, and the dress of women. It taxes and supervises trade, and forces fair weights and measures and honest quality so far as the ingenuity of human rascality permits. It limits the export of food, and enacts sharp laws to govern and chasten the practices of merchants and tradesmen. It watches the grain trade carefully, and legislates severely against corners, even to the death penalty, by forbidding the purchase of more than seventy-five bushels of wheat at a time. It interdicts loans on outgoing cargoes unless the return shipment is to bring grain to the Piraeus. It requires that all corn loaded by vessels owned in Athens shall be brought to the Piraeus, and it prohibits the export of more than a third of any corn cargo that reaches that port. By keeping a reserve of grain in state-owned storehouses, and pouring this upon the market when prices rise too rapidly, Athens sees to it that the price of bread shall never be exorbitant, that millionaires shall not be created out of the hunger of the people, and that no Athenian shall starve. The state regulates wealth through taxation and liturgies, and persuades or compels rich men to supply funds for the fleet, the drama, and the theoric payments that enable the poor to attend the plays and the games. 
For the rest, Athens protects freedom of trade, private property, and the opportunity to profit, deeming them the necessary implements of human liberty and the most powerful stimuli to industry, commerce, and prosperity. Under this system of economic individualism tempered with socialistic regulation, wealth accumulates in Athens and spreads sufficiently to prevent a radical revolution. To the end of ancient Athens, private property remains secure. The number of citizens with a comfortable income doubles between 480 and 431. The public revenue grows, public expenditures rise, and yet the treasury is full beyond any precedent in Greek history. The economic basis of Athenian freedom, enterprise, art, and thought is firmly laid, and will bear without strain every extravagance of the Golden Age, except the war by which all Greece will be ruined. Chapter 13 The Morals and Manners of the Athenians 1. Childhood Every Athenian citizen is expected to have children, and all the forces of religion, property, and the state unite to discountenance childlessness. Where no offspring comes, adoption is the rule, and high prices are paid for prepossessing orphans. At the same time, law and public opinion accept infanticide as a legitimate safeguard against excess population and a pauperizing fragmentation of the land. Any father may expose a newborn child to death either as doubtfully his or as weak or deformed. The children of slaves are seldom allowed to live. Girls are more subject to exposure than boys, for every daughter has to be provided with a dowry, and at marriage she passes from the home and service of those who have reared her into the service of those who have not. Exposure is effected by leaving the infant in a large earthenware vessel within the precincts of a temple or in some other place where it can soon be rescued if any wish to adopt it. The parental right to expose permits a rough eugenics and cooperates with a rigorous natural selection by hardship and competition to make the Greeks a strong and healthy people. The philosophers almost unanimously approve of family limitation. Plato will call for the exposure of all feeble children and of those born of base or elderly parents and Aristotle will defend abortion as preferable to infanticide. The Hippocratic Code of Medical Ethics will not allow the physician to effect abortion, but the Greek midwife is an experienced hand in this field, and no law impedes her. We have no evidence of contraceptive devices among the Greeks. On or before the tenth day after birth, the child is formally accepted into the family with a religious ritual around the hearth, and receives presents and a name. Usually, a Greek has but one name, like Socrates or Archimedes. But since it is customary to call the eldest son after the paternal grandfather, repetition is frequent, and Greek history is confounded with the multiplicity of Xenophons, Eschineses, Thucydideses, Diogeneses, and Zenos. To avoid ambiguity, the father's name or the place of birth may be added, as with Cimon Miltiadu, Simon, son of Miltiades, or Diodorus Siculus. Diodorus of Sicily, or the problem may be solved by some jolly nickname, like Calimedon, the crab. Once the child is so accepted into the family, it cannot lawfully be exposed, and is reared with all the affection that parents lavish upon their children in every age. Themistocles describes his son as the real ruler of Athens, for he, Themistocles, the most influential man in the city, is ruled by his wife, who is ruled by their child. Many an epigram in the Greek anthology reveals a tender parental love. I wept at the death of my Theony, but the hopes centered in our child lightened my sorrows. And now envious fate has bereaved me of the boy as well. Alas, I am cheated of thee, my child, all that was left to me. Persephone, hear this cry of a father's grief, and lay the child upon his dead mother's breast. The tragedies of adolescence are eased with many games, some of which will survive the memory of Greece. On a white perfume vase made for a child's grave, a little boy is seen taking his toy cart with him down to Hades. Babies have terracotta rattles containing pebbles. Girls keep house with their dolls. Boys fight great campaigns with play soldiers and generals. Nurses push children on swings or balance them on seesaws. Boys and girls roll hoops, fly kites, spin tops, play hide-and-seek or blindman's buff or tug-of-war and wage a hundred merry contests with pebbles, nuts, coins, and balls. The marbles of the Golden Age are dried beans shot from the fingers, or smooth stones shot or tossed into a circle to dislodge enemy stones and come to rest as near as possible to the center. As children approach the age of reason, seven or eight, 
They take up the game of dice by throwing square knuckle bones, the highest throw, six, being counted the best. The games of the young are as old as the sins of their fathers. 2. Education Athens provides public gymnasiums and palestras and exercises some loose supervision over teachers, but the city has no public schools or state universities, and education remains in private hands. Plato advocates state schools, but Athens seems to believe that even in education, competition will produce the best results. Professional schoolmasters set up their own schools, to which freeborn boys are sent at the age of six. The name Pythagogos is given not to the teacher but to the slave who conducts the boy daily to and from school. We hear of no boarding schools. Attendance at school continues till fourteen or sixteen, or till a later age among the well-to-do. The schools have no desks but only benches. The pupil holds on his knee the roll from which he reads or the material upon which he writes. Some schools, anticipating much later fashions, are adorned with statues of Greek heroes and gods. A few are elegantly furnished. The teacher teaches all subjects and attends to character as well as intellect, using a sandal. The curriculum has three divisions, writing, music, and gymnastics. Eager modernists will add, in Aristotle's day, drawing and painting. Writing includes reading and arithmetic, which uses letters for numbers. Everyone learns to play the lyre, and much of the material of instruction is put into poetical and musical form. No time is spent in acquiring any foreign language, much less a dead one, but great care is taken in learning the correct usage of the mother tongue. Gymnastics are taught chiefly in the gymnasium and the palestra, and no one is considered educated who has not learned to wrestle, swim, and use the bow and the sling. The education of girls is carried on at home and is largely confined to domestic science. Outside of Sparta, girls take no part in public gymnastics. They are taught by their mothers or nurses to read and write and reckon, to spin and weave and embroider, to dance and sing and play some instrument. A few Greek women are well-educated, but these are mostly hetairai. For respectable ladies, there is no secondary education until Aspasia lures a few of them into rhetoric and philosophy. Higher education for men is provided by professional rhetors and sophists who offer instruction in oratory, science, philosophy, and history. These independent teachers engage lecture halls near the gymnasium or palestra and constitute together a scattered university for free platonic Athens. Only the prosperous can study under them, for they charge high fees. But ambitious youths work by night in mill or field in order to be able to attend by day the classes of these nomadic professors. When boys reach the age of sixteen, they are expected to pay special attention to physical exercises, as fitting them in some measure for the tasks of war. Even their sports give them indirectly a military preparation. They run, leap, wrestle, hunt, drive chariots, and hurl the javelin. At eighteen, they enter upon the second of the four stages of Athenian life, Pais, Ephibos, Aner, Geron, child, youth, man, elder, and are enrolled into the ranks of Athens's soldier youth, the Ephiboi. Under moderators chosen by the ranks of their tribes, they are trained for two years in the duties of citizenship and war. They live and eat together, wear an impressive uniform, and submit to moral supervision night and day. They organize themselves democratically on the model of the city, meet in assembly, pass resolutions, and erect laws for their own governance. They have archons, strategoi, and judges. For the first year they are schooled with strenuous drill and hear lectures on literature, music, geometry, and rhetoric. At nineteen they are assigned to garrison the frontier and are entrusted for two years with the protection of the city against attack from without and disorder within. Solemnly, in the presence of the Council of Five Hundred, with hands stretched over the altar in the temple of Agraulus, they take the oath of the young men of Athens. I will not disgrace the sacred arms, nor will I abandon the man next to me, whoever he may be. I will bring aid to the ritual of the state and to the holy duties, both alone and in company with many. I will transmit my native commonwealth, not lessened, but larger and better than I have received it. I will obey those who from time to time are judges. I will obey the established statutes and whatever other regulations the people shall enact. If anyone shall attempt to destroy the statutes, I will not permit it, but will repel him both alone and with all. I will honor the ancestral faith. The Ephiboi are assigned a special place at the theater and play a prominent role in the religious processions of the city. Perhaps it is such young men that we see riding so handsomely on the Parthenon frieze. Periodically they exhibit their accomplishments in public contests, above all in the relay torch race from the Piraeus to Athens. 
All the city comes out for this picturesque event and lines the four-and-a-half-mile road. The race is run at night, and the way is not illuminated. All that can be seen of the runners is the leaping light of the torches that they carry forward and pass on. When, at the age of twenty-one, the training of the Ephoboy is completed, they are freed from parental authority and formally admitted into the full citizenship of the city. Such is the education, eked out by lessons learned in the home and in the street, that produces the Athenian citizen. It is an excellent combination of physical and mental, moral and aesthetic training, a supervision in youth with freedom and maturity, and in its heyday it turns out young men as fine as any in history. After Pericles, theory grows and beclouds practice. Philosophers debate the goals and methods of education, whether the teacher should aim chiefly at intellectual development or at moral character, chiefly at practical ability or the promotion of abstract science. But all agree in attaching the highest importance to education. When Aristippus is asked in what way the educated are superior to the untutored, he answers, as broken horses are to the unbroken. And Aristotle to the same question replies, as the living are to the dead. At least, adds Aristippus, if the pupil derives no other good, he will not, when he attends the theatre, be one stone upon another. 3. Externals The citizens of Athens in the 5th century are men of medium height, vigorous, bearded, and not all as handsome as Phidias's horsemen. The ladies of the vases are graceful, and those of the steely have a dignified loveliness, and those molded by the sculptors are supremely beautiful. But the actual ladies of Athens, limited in their mental development by an almost oriental seclusion, are at best as pretty as their Near Eastern sisters, but no more. The Greeks admire beauty even beyond other nations, but they do not always embody it. Greek women, like others, find their figures a little short of perfection. They lengthen them with high cork soles on their shoes, pad out deficiencies with wadding, compress abundances with lacing, and support the breasts with a cloth brassiere. Plutarch tells a pretty story of how an epidemic of suicide among the women of Miletus was suddenly and completely ended by an ordinance decreeing that self-slain women should be carried naked through the marketplace to their burial. The hair of the Greeks is usually dark. Blondes are exceptional and much admired. Many women and some men dye their hair to make it blonde or to conceal the grayness of age. Both sexes use oils to help the growth of the hair and to protect it against the sun. The women and again some men add perfumes to the oil. Both sexes in the sixth century wear the hair long, usually bound in braids around or behind the head. In the fifth century, the women vary their coiffure by knotting the hair low on the nape of the neck or letting it fall over the shoulders or around the neck and upon the breast. The ladies like to bind their hair with gay ribbons and to adorn these with a jewel on the forehead. After Marathon, the men begin to cut their hair. After Alexander, they will shave their mustaches and beards with sickle-shaped razors of iron. No Greek ever wears a mustache without a beard. The beard is neatly trimmed, usually to a point. The barber not only cuts the hair and shaves or trims the beard, but he manicures his customer and otherwise polishes him up for presentation. When he is finished, he offers him a mirror in the most modern style. The barber has his shop, which is a center for the wineless symposia, as Theophrastus calls them, of the local gossips and gadflies. But he often works outside it under the sky. He is garrulous by profession, and when one of his kind asks King Archelaus of Macedon how he would like to have his hair cut, the king answers, in silence. The women also shave here and there, using razors or depilatories of arsenic and lime. Perfumes, made from flowers with a base of oil, are numbered in the hundreds. Socrates complains that men make so much use of them. Every lady of class has an armory of mirrors, pins, hairpins, safety pins, tweezers, combs, scent bottles, and pots for rouge and creams. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.